through do we want to walk through what happens when you call ease or what happens um, in the update command or what do we think i think um we should probably start with let's see i think the update command is probably the best place to start okay even though it seems like we're jumping into the middle i think that's a good place to start looking so obviously the update command what's the idea is that we're going to call it once every frame right yeah i'm sorry i'm just scrolling i'm, I'm trying to find this part where we do Lua. here you go Lua effect update right uh where would that be this is line 705 on the dev branch i can switch to the um main one if you i think you i be in the have same. Yeah, um, I think I have it on GitHub. Um, this might be an uncommitted version of the dev branch. Let me just um here remove. You're gonna be like, wait, you can't remove that because there is a git clone https um github dot com. Zero L not IQG. There we go. Perfect. So now we're on latest master, which is 2.0. For anyone listening to the recording, thank you for listening. Okay. okay. Here we go. So let me scroll through. We're going. We're looking for Lua effect. So first of all, let me actually just fold this more. We can, um, here we go. So here's the basic structure here, right? We've got an on command function. We've got a begin update command function. And then way down here, we've got an actual update command function, okay, right? And this is in template.xml, is it? This is template.xml. Right here, template.xml. Template I wish I had um, syntax for this. Um, what editor are you using? I'm using VS Code. I think VS Code has an editor. Look up XML Lua. It's I think it's by FMS Cat. Yeah, I haven't installed. Is there like a config I can do? Because the conditions, working? the conditions don't um, have the syntax. Oh, fair enough. Um, you could switch to Vim and use my highlighter. <laughs> Not that you'll want to, because you can see it's buggy and broken right now. <laughs> it works if you unfold everything. It just doesn't like to understand the idea that Lua can last indefinitely long. So it likes to go back to the XML. If oh, you unfold I see. It, it works. Um... But I wanted to look at the folder version for one. Yeah. Here we go. So, this syntax kind of sucks. We'll unfold it later. Actually, let's just unfold everything and just work unfolded. Come on, unfold everything. Okay. So, oops. Let me just read, okay. Um, we're going to template.xml. We are unfolding everything. Perfect. Okay, so let's start at the update command. Right? Matt Lua effect update. Well, so the, the actual definition of update command, if you look to the very bottom of the file, the last three lines are um, some definitions, right? Okay. So if you notice update command, it's not an inline function. It's um, referencing a variable that already exists, which is update underscore command, which is just a global. Well, not really global. It's in the zero table. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the zero thing. No, yeah. But um, basically that is the function. It's literally, so if you go to line 837, that is the beginning of the function, that the definition. Yeah. So that is running every frame, right? And we can walk through each section. So this first section here, um, 839 through 841, is getting the beat, right? Mm -hmm. So this is immediately getting the beat. And then we check if it's equal to the old beat and then return. 
which you might be thinking, why are you doing that check? Aren't you um, running this every frame? But it turns out the frame rate and like the internal tick rate of the game is different. So sometimes game state gets on beat will give you the same number more than once. And oh. in that case, I'm going to calculate the same mod values anyway, so it's not even worth running the function again. Yeah. For that frame. And then we mark down old beat equals beat, and old beat is it's literally right there. It's the local here. Yeah. So now, step one is we're looking at the eases list. So eases is a list that has been constructed based on um, what's gone on before. And eases index is a number, and it starts at zero. Or one, let's say. So the first check, we want to say while we're not at the end of the eases list, and the eases at our index um, has started. Does that make sense? Yep. The, the plan is this is like, um if you've ever looked in Exquasion, this is like your the function you're on. E each of these eases, you might think, oh, isn't an ease active for more than one frame? And we'll get to that if you actually look down. There's an active eases down here. But mm -hmm. each ease only activates once. So we can just keep an index. And most of the time, this while loop on the fast case is just going to say... I don't need to activate this beat, this at the next beat. Like it won't, this this inequality won't trigger for eases index here most of the time. So that's the fast case is you skip over this entire while loop and say, oh, there's no new eases to activate. But if you do activate one, we are going to um, pull out that ease. And if it's a reset ease, you have to deal with it specially. Okay. So our resets. Do you know what re how reset works in the mirror template? Yeah. Uh, I've also noticed that um, you can't actually, like, chain resets. Um, like, you can't put you one reset that? and then put, like, three tables that have different beats for them. You actually have to put reset and then a, um, a table. And then if you want another one right after, you have to put another reset. And that then sounds a like a bug. Hold on. Let's look up. Hold on. Let me just find this real quick. Part of me thought it was a bug, and part of me thought it was intentional, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, this should have a return reset here. I will note that down for later. Um, um but I'm going to not put that in yet, just, to, just so that we can have line numbers that line up with the current master. Yeah. But. I think that might be a little off sync, but I'm still able to follow. It's like only two line difference right now. Okay. Perfect. So. Um, if it's a reset ease, so you might be thinking, hold on, resets are not eases. But um, we'll go over the, the input system at the front. It does actually a, rel a decent amount of processing at the beginning. The, the important thing to know is resets are one of the things that gets put into this eases table. So if it's a reset, then what it does is it goes Wait, through... resets um, aren't eases? Can you ease a reset? You can put eases on it, yeah. Okay. So it's it not is literally ease. using the it, it's not literally using the word ease, so it might not be obvious because yeah, in yeah. other templates you have different table readers for different tables, and in the mirror template it's sort of like that, except for we only have a couple of tables, and eases is one of the tables. So anyway, resets. What does it do? Is it goes through all of the targets, and you might be thinking, where did this targets table come from? Um, targets is a one of the globals. Um, there are a couple of globals, and I can kind of collect them if you want me to. But the important ones to know for this is there are the way we store eases is by their targets, and there's a targets table and a mods table. And okay. here's mods table. And the targets table is like if I were to finish all of the eases that are currently active right now, where would they be? And the mods table is like if I were to want to apply mods right now in a mod spring, what are the percentages? Does that make sense? Yep. So maybe we'll look at the reset after. But um, basically, we might relook at it if it's still confusing. But we say we'll check every single mod that has been applied so far in the, in the targets. For, so everything in the targets. So we're literally checking every single everything yeah and if it's not excluded and it's different than the default value default mods is another thing we can explain how it gets constructed later but um 
basically there is a set default function and that goes into this default mods table. Okay. And um, if that's the case, then we use push, which push is just table.insert. Um, back when I wrote this, I was suspicious of table.insert, so I used my own function, but I need to go back and swap them all back at some point. Um, basically, I used push instead of table of insert and dot n instead of table dot get n. So anyway, it pushes for, for every single mon. This is pushing. It's literally, imagine that you have an ease, right? Except for it just has the first three numbers. right? I'll, I can put it in if you're watching the screen. If I have like ease and I have 0, 1, I would expo. Um, what happens when you push a string and then a mod is that you are literally adding on, you know, 0, dizzy here, right? Yeah. So it's literally just dumping them into the ease to turn it into a normal ease, right? So if it's a reset, then the plan is at runtime, you check the targets table and see what's going on and turn it into an ease that's normal, right? Okay. So now we've dealt with the resets and we now have a conformed normal ease. We store a value in this ease thing called offset, which we'll use later. And that is just transient, but turned into a number. And transient is a thing that gets set earlier. Um, if it's relative, so um, if you use the add function, it literally just calls the ease function, except for it adds this relative flag to your ease. So we're still in like one of these things. Okay. So like if I add ease zero one out expo and then a hundred rotation z, if I add this relative equals true. Um, it's the same as calling add over here. Okay. I'm, I mean, don't don't take my word for, for that because I don't think it's exactly the same, but that's the idea here, is that this is how you distinguish between an add and a normal call. So the add ones are relative. So if it's not relative, then we turn it to become relative. So ease is actually not the default behavior. It's if we are an ease. This is basically saying if it's an ease and not an add, right? Okay. And in that case, we go in and we subtract from the targets. So if I say, um, let's say I want the numbers to go to 200%, but it's already at 100%, then we subtract the value so it's just 100. We just have the offset stored here. So now we have all add eases is the way to think of that, right? Does that? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. So now we check for if it's not transient. And transient is a word that I came up with to define, basically to describe an ease. So if I have an e, or like an ease function. So if I have 0, 1, and then I have pop, pop is transient. And that means that it's not actually changing the target. Because um, pop, if you pop a mod, I don't know if you've used pop before, but yeah, the value is supposed the to end at this. <laughs> it's supposed to end at the same part as it stops. So even yeah. if I ease with pop to like a thousand or a hundred invert. It's not gonna end at a hundred invert, right? So I don't need to do anything here because it, you know, I only have to yeah. do it if it isn't transient. So if I have like out expo, um, you know, oh, this is actually changing the value of the mod. So I set the target to immediately go to where it's intended to go to, right? Okay. So the target jumps up to a hundred the moment we hit beat zero. The moment we hit beat zero, the target is already up at a hundred. And the plan is we dump this in the active eases table to move it back from 100 back down to, you know, zero, then to to follow the ease, right? Okay. So the idea is, let's say, hypothetically, I start the file at beat, like, 5,000. Mm -hmm. Then what's going to happen is it's going to get pushed into the active eases, and then it's going to get tossed out of the active eases because it's not useful. You know, it's not active anymore because the yeah. length is only one. And then what, the only change that's going to be left over is that the target is set to the, you know, to 100. And if there were a million eases in this loop, I would loop through and subtract the target back down, let's say, if it had if I had to skip over multiples. So that's how it skips quickly. Okay. That's the idea there. So, so now, it's almost as if what it's, I guess, like, what it uh -huh. seems like it's doing is that it's almost like instead of setting the, like... Instead of setting the mod, so like instead of going from um, like from zero to a hundred, it technically is almost as if it's like it's already at a hundred or it's already at mm -hmm. like hundred and negative it just has 100 to be animation. Yeah, 
it's 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 almost as if instead of setting the um instead of setting the end point you're like setting the start point relative to the end point as if the end point is already at there if that's what yeah I'm... the target changes instantly it's kind of like if you've ever used a menu system that's animated like the moment you start the animation it's technically internally already done but it still will play the animation later Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. So internally, it's already there. So that means if you have an ease that starts later, it will know to use where where the value's headed to as opposed to like the current value. Okay. So that's how it covers like overlaps. Is that internally these are happening instantly? So that's kind of where that's going. Okay. And then um, we push it into the active eases. We push E is it the value we were working on into the active eases. And then we add the eases index, which is again, it's a, it's not a global, but it's a local that's outside the update command. We add one there. So the idea is, um, this while loop won't really run more than once for most of your frames. It will only run once an ease needs to be activated. So it will run once for every single ease ever, right? That makes sense. So this isn't running every ease every frame. This is running just whenever you hit a new ease that needs to start, then it will do all this processing and then toss it into this active eases table. And the active eases table is where the actual mod values get manipulated, right? Okay, so the actual while loop, like, it only runs for, like, maybe a split second. And then... Yeah, you can think of there... this as 99.9999% of the time, this while loop is just going to skip. It's going to say, oh, there's no new eases to be activated. I'm not on a beat where a new ease starts, so I don't need to do any of this relative processing. I don't need to add any new things to the active eases table. I'm done. I'm just going to skip. Okay. It's 99.9% .9 of the cases. So now you can see the fast case is fast. Right? And that's one thing that I'm hoping you're, you'll notice in every single step of the on command is that the fast case will always be pretty much like one check and you're done. Okay. So now we're on this loop, this while loop. And this while loop isn't like the previous one, it's going to run over and over again. So every single update, it has to go through every single active ease, right? Okay. And so that's basically just a for loop except for convoluted. So we make a local that starts at one, and while it's less than n, we do the loop. And so we e is going to be our variable again. I guess I used the convention of e being the, the current entry, I think is the word I was thinking of. But okay. E is the current one we're on, and we pull out PLR for convenience, and then if, so the first if statement is if we are, um, if it's during the range. So internally, everything uses len, so E1 plus E2 is going to be the end time, right? Okay. So if our beat is still going, if we're still during the range, then we have this crazy nasty function, which I hope you can trust me when I say that calls the ease. Ease is E3. So E3. And then um, we subtract offset, which comes from earlier. If you remember earlier, offset was whether or not it was transient. Yeah. But as a 0 or 1. So the idea is, if it was transient, so let's say it's pop, then it's just pop. It just calls pop, right? Yeah. But if it was like out expo, then we subtract 1 from it. So this actually goes from like negative 1 up to 0. Okay. Which hopefully makes sense given the fact that we've already moved the target up to 100, right? Yeah. So now imagine, so the idea is if at the very beginning of the ease, it's going to be, the target's already going to be at 100, but we're getting negative one here, so we're going to subtract it back down to the start of the ease. Yeah. Because we're kind of playing these animations reactively to the target. So that's the plan there. And then we go through this for loop, which the bounds look stupid, this for e.n2. But this is going through every other entry past i equals 4. So I don't actually do any processing for the eases, the, like the, the ease table format. It's literally just the first three are start, length, and ease, and then everything past that is alternating numbers and mods. Okay. There's, there's no processing to turn that into like an actual list or anything fancy. Um, oops. Hold on. Let's go back to where I was. My bad. Um, so here we here we are. So we loop through each mod, we grab the name of the mod, and we write it into this mods table. 
right? Mm -hmm. So we so add on our percent times the the computed the, the computed ease result, which we called e three because it was e slot three. Um, so this, for example, would bring the invert back down. So mods, I'll tell you. So targets has a meta table where it's reading from default mods if if the, if the key isn't present. Mods has the meta table, so it's reading from targets if the key isn't present. Okay. Does that make sense? So let's say hypothetically we had an invert ease because I really like them. Um, this mods thing, it would read in the value. If Let's say we added 100 here. It's the first frame that our, our ease is starting. This at, The target would be at 100, but then here we would read 100 because this is reading from targets. Mm -hmm. Mods defaults to targets the first time, and then... After that, it's going to read from mods because that's how meta tables work, and then it would subtract 100 back down because e would be negative one times 100 percent. We write that back in. Okay. And then we add one to our our thing, and then it's done with the if statement and done with the loop, and we're back to like that's how a for loop works. But there's a special case where if the beat is passed, right? Mm -hmm. So if let's say we have something in active eases. But it doesn't. It, we don't want it in active uses anymore. We want to toss it out, right? Okay. Then what you do is you go to this else case, and what you'll notice is we've got some a for loop that looks really redundant, right? Mm, kind of, yeah. So what it's doing is it's reading from the mod, and then it's literally writing back into mods what it's read from here plus zero. <laughs> You're like, wait. Plus zero a, seems kind of. <laughs> I don't think the plus zero is necessary, but you might be thinking, isn't this a? <laughs> you're reading, you're writing back into what you've read, right? Yeah. And I think at some point in history, I had a comment here that says this line massages the meta tables or something <laughs> funny like that. And because what it's doing is it's taking, it's saying basically read from targets, but then write it into mods. So later on, we'll do a loop and see which keys are present in mods and apply all of those. So what this is saying is basically, hey, you're done, but you need to take the value from targets and have it in the mods table at least once so it will get applied. So this basically promotes it to a, a you should apply this. Okay. This frame. So even if you're done, so let's say I've, let's say, or hypothetically, let's say I start at the 70 billion, right? Uh -huh. And there was an ease in the table. It's going to come into this active eases, and it's going to hit this else case, and it's, this is going to say, hey, I know you don't want to, or, you know, basically it will say, hey, you might want to apply 0% invert right now, or 100% invert right now. Because, mm. again, this defaults to the target, so it will say, hey, you, right now you need to apply 100%. Yeah, invert. and I've noticed with, like, sometimes with some eases that it'll, like, mm -hmm. it'll, like, tween to it, and then just kind of, like, like, especially with um, uh, out expo. Mm -hmm. Like, as it starts getting closer, like, it's almost as if as soon as that beat is over, it'll, like, snap into place, kind of? Yeah, so Out Expo, if you look at the original definition, isn't actually flush at the end. Yeah, definitely it's not. It's exponential decaying, so it won't actually hit zero. Yeah. So it does do the snap, and that is because, if you notice, this final value that we calculate has nothing to do with the ease. We're not even looking at this anymore. Yeah. It's literally just pulling from targets. Yeah. It's um, and just... then, yeah, you get the idea. And then importantly, if you have more than one ease at the same time, it will just add them together here. Because this won't pull from targets, it will be whatever the previous one was, and it adds on, right? So that's how the additive magic works. Yeah. If you've ever seen eases that have overlapping ranges, this is how it's well-defined, even if two ranges are active at the same time. Yeah. So anyway, this does nothing. I think the plus zero is technically unnecessary, but this whole line is is necessary because that's what it's doing. Yeah. And then we, um, you might think, why don't you just table dot remove? But what we're doing here is you actually pull the last active ease, and you just move that into the current index. You see what's going on there? Let's see. So actually, and these eggs no. You're basically going to say, hey, take whatever was at the end of the list and put it in the in my slot. Yeah. And that is an it, that's an 01 table dot remove because um you're not keeping the order. You're just taking whatever was last at the end 
and then moving it here, and then getting rid of it off, off the end, right? Yeah. And then n equals n minus 1 because I'm not using table.get and I'm manually managing my ends. So I have to tell it that the list is one shorter for the for loop. Okay. Um, and that's that's that. So then obviously we didn't get an active eases index equals active eases index plus 1. So now when we do the while loop, we're going to pick, we're going to be at the same index, but it's going to do it again, but this time with whatever we subbed in from the last, from the end of the list, right? All right. So that's the active eases loop. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that's actually um, that's a really good way to do it, actually. Yeah, most of this is designed with, like, I, I made a head, like, to make absolute sure this the update loop needs to have the fast case be fast. So if you notice, also, if there's no active eases, it just skips. Yeah. Right. And so now we're on to funks. Functions are kind of a pain. If you remember the... They're very funky. If you've ever looked at this... If you've looked at the arguments, there are like a million different types of yeah. functions that you can put in. <laughs> but it actually gets simplified down to just um there are two formats. I can have um you know put this here, funk. It's not this isn't these aren't real funk calls, but this is the format. You can have a beat and then a nil and then a function here. And that is I want this to run once on the beat. And you can have a b in a len in a function. Here. Len, right? Okay. So these are the two formats we have to deal with. Yeah. Um, and if you want to know how does my a million argument function call get compressed into this, we can look at the definition of func. But most of that preprocessing stuff is done beforehand, and it's kind of template specific. It won't give you a good insight into how templates work in general. You get the idea. Um, so let's look here. So step one is we pull it out into E. Um, you can tell the convention here by now is E is our current entry that we're looking at in our in the table. Mm -hmm. And if if not E2, so if it doesn't have a length, if I go back our examples here, if there's no len here, then we just need to call it once, right? Okay. Um, and if you'll notice, there's no sustain times in these formats. So um, if I want to have a sustain time system, you're going to need to check in here with the beat, um, you know, do a check. Yeah. Check. You know what I mean? You'll have to compare the beat to how whenever you want it to, and if that's the case, then you run it. But that's all inside of that function. Yeah. Then, again, the detail is in the function. Well, so we call it immediately. Notice we pass in the beat so that when you are doing that sustain time, magic you can check and see if the real beat that it was called is too late so like imagine i press play on my mod file and i've, I've scrolled the editor to beat 100 and there's a funk that's at beat 30. um the idea is this will get passed in 100 here so it will be able to know that it's running super late okay um and then otherwise this else is for the case where um there is a length and we say well is it in range right so the idea is if there's a if there's a per frame oh I should I should explain this as well. Um this guy up here, sustain time infinity. This guy down here, no sustain time. So if it's past the length, we completely skip it. Okay. And that is part of my funk format. That's pretty much what's going on. So if I if I do have a length like this with a sustain time, so like for example, when I call funk, if you give this an ease, this is a funk call now, and I give it to two numbers here. The semantics says technically that this should have a sustain time. So the way that does it is the func function will go in and um, put in two entries into the list. It will put one here that's at the len. You know what I mean? It will do b plus len. Yeah. And then say, you know, finish up here. And then in here, it says, you know, currently running is how it would look. Okay. Right. So that's all handled before we get to this point, because I want this for loop to be as simple as possible. So anyway, here we add to the active function, and you'll notice there's some magic here, right? Active funks is not just a table. There's shenanigans going on. Yeah, that's... There's an add method. And we can get to that in a bit, but this is to preserve... I don't think this property... I don't think people care about this property anymore. 
but this is to preserve function order. Um, there's a weird special case where, um, imagine I have a function here, right, or I'll call func, and I have a length, let's put it at beat um, 10, and for 10 beats, and we'll call a function. Oh, I'll do that. And in here we will print A, and then, hold on, and here we'll have a one that starts at five and it will print B, right? So the question is, if I'm on beat, let's say 15, I'm in the range of, or not 15, let's say I'm in beat 13, I'm in the range of both of these, right? And I'm on one, one frame, what order do these run within the frame? Um, print, uh, so, print B should run first, right? Um, the semantics are actually print A runs first because okay. I called this funk first. I oh. inserted it first. Right, okay. And that is a weird concept because it's like technically this thing is going to reach B first. So how would you get A to run first? And so I have created a custom special data structure called or this active funks thing has its own custom data structure that will all handle all of that to make that technically well defined. Okay. But um, if you're not really worried about this interdependency, this this it, this was important before we had nodes, because yeah. if you remember, the historical system is this takes a beat and this also takes in I call it options, right? And then in here I can do four pn equals one, comma two, do oops, that is not the word do. I hate autocomplete do, yeah. and then we've got options pn dot invert equals 100 you know what i mean yeah so now when, once you start doing stuff like this the order semantically matters but now it doesn't really matter anymore i've just it's basically legacy code is one way to think about it so did i make this line i don't know i'll just assume not um so that's what's going on with this ad and we can go over this if you're interested but um it's kind of weird. Basically, the, the idea is you keep track of functions that were added this frame, and then you do like a merge sort kind of thing to merge that in with the functions that are already existing based on some pre-existing order that's defined in here. Okay. And we and you can look at the func, and it will add like a number to each to each thing to keep track of the order that they've come in, and it will use that number, the ID number, to merge them. And we don't want to think about that, so that's why I wrapped it into these functions. So anyway, <laughs> this is a while true. This is this uses like a Java iterator style system, if you've ever used iterators in Java. So there's this next function, and then there's this remove. And what next says is, is grab me the next item. And remove says, you'll notice it doesn't take any arguments. It says, whatever item you just gave me previously, I want you to um, also take that out of the data structure. So we'll, we'll get to that when we do through this loop. So we have a while true loop. So you might be thinking, hold on, isn't while true a terrible idea <laughs> for, for performance? But if you'll notice inside of here, the first thing is if not E, then break, right? Yeah. So basically, we're, this is, again, it's like a Java iterator if you've ever used one. We are calling next until it returns nil. And if there's no active functions, it's going to return nil immediately. Yeah. So that's fun. So assuming we do get a function though, what we do is we'll check, and these will come in in order because of the active funks magic. We'll check if the beat is in the range. And if we're in range still, we set this options logging target. This is where we get to some, <laughs> some hacky code. <laughs> is e.mods, and you might be wondering, hold on, what is dot mods? I don't remember ever having a mods equals in a funk. Um, and that's right, it gets added in. This is like legacy, this is Poptions code. I don't know if you've ever used Poptions. Occasionally. I've been using it a lot more since I've been writing that. Since you're aware script. of it? Do we have the Poptions still here? Yeah, Poptions. Yeah. Um, so anyway, ideally you would be using Node instead of Poptions, but um, this was the old interface before we had Node. Mm -hmm. One thing you'll notice here is if you run this function right here, let's get rid of the print. If you have something like this, 
you'll notice that invert will stay on for 10 beats and then it will reset back to zero okay when it's done and you might be wondering how does it know to reset invert you know there was no ease that ended or active ease with invert how does it know to end and that's what this logging target is for it's very illegal but um we can go over all the meta table magic involved there and it's actually only like five or six lines of meta tables but as you know five or six lines of meta table is a lot to comprehend so yeah. <laughs> so that's what's going on basically we mark this down and say basically in case e uses this options table um we want to store which ones it's which mods it's touched so that we can reset them at the end of e and okay. then else if we are at the end then we check was there this mods and if so we are going to loop through all of the players and um we're gonna massage, massage them the yeah <laughs> yeah we're gonna massage them on table to basically say i want you to refresh i want you to pull this from target if you haven't already you're stressed you need a break you yeah Grab the temples yeah so again if mods already has the thing in it this does nothing but if mods doesn't have the value in it yet it's going to pull from targets because of the meta table of mods right yeah so it basically promotes it to say this is an important thing that you have to recalculate and now you can see why if you did that that function that i had up here before invert would jump back to zero when it's done yeah. because right when it's tossing it out it's it does that and then also we remove which again there's no argument here we don't pass in an e and that's because of the way the active folks data structure works it's very hard coded for this particular loop <laughs> okay so now we've gone through that. We know how functions work. So um, is node basically like, because mm -hmm. um, I'm noticing that node kind of has a tiny bit of a similar structure to func. Well, it's the same concept is that you have a function that's planning on running, except yeah. for instead of being able to manage it with this sort of beat based loop where it's like, what beat is it? Um, okay, now I know which functions to run. Node uses a different strategy to identify when to run, but it's the same idea. Okay. And we'll get to that here, because this is... Oh, we have the three comments that actually exist. But um, <laughs> So now is the part where we want to actually apply the, the mods, right? Okay. We're finally at the end of the update loop. That's actually all we had to do, pretty much. This is the final oh, step. Oh, there's mod buffer. It's, it's string builder. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, um... String Builder, if you want to see what it is, is it's actually here in in the standard.xml. I don't really have that great of a of a definition of what goes in standard and what goes in not standard. But standard is stuff that is less immediately related to processing mods. Yeah, stuff that's like pretty much like the very structure of like mm, things you will do. Yeah. So we've got an insertion sort. We've got a merge sort that um you know if the table is less than 12 long then it will call insertion sort otherwise it will do its merge sort recursively um magic numbers. you don't need to look you don't need to know how merge sort works if you're listening to the audio hello listeners <laughs> um we've got some comparators we've got a meta operator that takes in a function takes in a comparator and gives you the backwards of the comparator um we've got stable sort which just calls merge sort, except for recur merge sort is technically a helper function because it has a bajillion arguments. So we have this wrapper called stable sort, which is actually global and exported. We've got a local ad. This isn't the real ad. This is um this is um back in the meta table or down here the perframe data structure. This is the back when we had um active funks colon ad, it's that ad right here. Okay. There's the add up here, um, and we've got the remove, and we've got the next, and next is a nightmare, <laughs> but you can tell it's just if statements, so it's technically a one to run. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's horribly illegal, but there you go. Except for the stable sort, so I guess the stable sort technically runs every once in a while, so it's not entirely a one. <laughs> um, but you don't need to worry about that. Unless you're interested in knowing how this works, we can go over it. But this is a really long tangent to get to String Builder. And I don't know if you can read meta table code well or not. This is a bit to to take in. Well, how about how we have the listeners answer 
Yeah. Like right Hello, now, just shout out your screen. Can, can you can, can you, you read, read Meta Tales? Me answer in the poll. It's on the screen in the top. <laughs> it's just edited in like a, a poll. Yeah. Wow, they answered that they could. So we'll go over it quickly, but um it's not too important. So basically string builder, this is a constructor that makes a new table, except for with these this meta table as the properties. And this meta table, if you call it, it um inserts stuff into it. So if you call call the string builder, it tosses whatever you called it with into the table, right? Okay. And then um, there's a function called build, which is just table.concat. So I don't know if you've ever used table.concat before. But the idea of table.concat is if you do table concat, and then um, you've got a table here with strings in it, like A, B, C, then this equals A, B, C. It can catch me, yeah. right? It's pretty simple. And you might be thinking, yeah, and you might be thinking, why does this exist? Why would anyone use this when you could just, you know, do a for loop for the in i pairs table? I'll just put t to you know accumulator equals accumulator dot dot v end, right? So we might be let's. I'm just real quick. This is important because it's a runtime thing. Um. You might be thinking, why don't why don't they just expect you to do this loop, right? Okay. But this loop, let's say this table has a billion things in it, right? Yeah. Or like let's say it has a hundred things that are all one letter long. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know how string allocation works in Lua, but you have to have a value that backs each string. And so this dot dot is constructing a new string every time, right? Yeah. So if this T has a hundred items in it then this is going to construct 100 strings mm -hmm. if you do it this way. And that's why they created this table that can cat so that you don't have to. Yep. Because this is a built-in thing that isn't implemented this way. It's implemented in C, and it will just generate them all. So the idea is I wanted a string builder that basically let me write the code in this way, where I'm looping through something and appending it. Except for instead of dot dot, I wanted to insert it. So I would, you know, ack equals you know, string builder. And then I just act. And then instead of dot dot, I, do, I just call it with the here. Yeah. But that's the idea. And now, and then it internally uses this concat when you ever you call build. Or whenever you call two string. So two string is also concat. And then um, we have the sep function, which is useless for what we're doing. We don't even call it in the update command. That is for node. We'll do that later. And so that's our string builder. We can go back. Um, jarring transition, but we're back here at the string builder line. <laughs> You're watching the, the thing back in template.xml. We make mod buffer as a new string builder. So this is the only table that we allocate every frame. Is that we've created a new buffer here. Um, one thing that I try to keep down specifically is creating tables. So that's one specific thing that I have designed this decision and gotten rid of. But we'll, we'll, let, me, let me go back a couple steps. We have the for loop. We loop up to max PN, which is by default 8. But what we do is we check, is the player there and is it awake, right? So 99% of the time, the player won't be awake for um, like extra players. So even if you are running a not ITG with 8 players with max PN set to 8, it's not running this 8 times, it's only running it twice. Yep. And fun fact is this is what clears the mods table here. So if you have a player that's asleep, then all of the changes that need to be done to it will accumulate in this mods table. So it will actually fast forward when you unsleep the actor. Oh. Isn't that fun? It's extremely fun. What do you think at home? Do you think that's fun, yeah. or do you think that's not? So, what we do is we add one to scene, and you might be thinking, why do you have a global named scene? Isn't that stupid? But this isn't a global, it's a local somewhere else, and this has to do with this propagate function. And um, do we want to skip those for now, or do we want to go over exactly how they work? Um. Well, it's up to you. Because skipping those were actually really quick here. So, um propagate propagates and it fills out this active nodes table and this active terminators table and um let's just um 
ignore those because let's say there were no nodes that got propagated by this propagate. Um, we go straight. I just want to skip this because this is the the node code and it's confusing. But we'll get to it later. So mod percent in pairs mods pn. So now we're finally reading through the mods, right? Mm -hmm. And we say if there's no aux, if it's not been auxed, so um, if you remember how aux works, if you aux a mod, that means you're not supposed to apply it, right? Yep. But if if we ha we don't have that, then we go in here and call mod buffer, which puts times negative one and then the mod. And it doesn't add the comma because the comma actually comes in here. If you know table.concat takes a separator argument and it will fill in the separator. Yeah. So this basically says fill in, put a comma in between everything. And then um, it nils out the mods, which is important here. So that way you can reuse the mods table up your frame. Okay. Um, and then if mod buffer one, you might be thinking, what is this check? But mod buffer is the string builder up here. So if you check the first item, that means did you insert anything into it? Pretty much is what you're asking. Yeah. Right? So if you haven't inserted anything into your string builder, that means there are no mods to apply this frame, which is actually pretty likely because um, you only have to apply stuff if they were active eases. But if that's the case, then we call apply modifiers. And you'll notice apply modifiers is underscored and not like game state apply modifiers. Yeah. Because I do some call somewhere up here. I it, it is game state apply modifiers unless you have a certain debug flag on, in which case it sets it to something else. Okay. Um, so basically, that's that's the debug hook. So that in case you want to see the values that it's applying every frame, which you don't. So <laughs> we'll, we'll just presume that's normal apply modifiers. And then it does that for all the players, and we're good. And then we have if debug print mod targets. This is literally false, so we don't print the targets. But if we did, we would um, do this, and it would print all of the targets of each player. Um, and then this, this, these debug flags are set to false, so they don't really matter. So now you know how. Now you know your way through an update command. Um, hopefully, we've covered. Um, these all have incredibly fast fast paths because um, I planned it that way. Mm -hmm. um, they're not doing too much because all of the heavy lifting, especially in Funk, is done at the processing side at the beginning. Um, and then here's how we construct the mods. And then real quick, let's go over nodes. Propagate all will... Basically, this is another loop through all the mods. So this is all of the mods that are active, right? Mm -hmm. And we um, check... Are there any node start? Anything in node start, which is a data structure that basically says here is all the nodes that immediately read a given mod, and so we propagate them to mark them as um, like active for this frame. And propagate is like recursive, and it will go through. Use the mod we've started at, and it will recursively go and activate all the mods that need to be activated, or all of the the nodes that need to be activated, and then we loop through all the active nodes. We've pulled it back out of the active node table and then just run it. We run slot six, which is kind of stupid, but um, nodes have a bunch of arguments in them. So specifically, slot six is where the function is. Um, these aren't these are nothing like the format you call node with. It does a bunch of processing on node. So slot six is not literally slot six in the argument. It's kind of weird. Okay. Um, the eases they reuse that table that you give it. Um, but nodes that doesn't. And then terminators are a special type of node that specifically need to be run after all of the normal nodes. And so <laughs> it does that. And so now, this if this wrote back to the mods table, it will have... Or the, the terminators are the only ones that write back to the mods table, I think, if I recall correctly. But then this will massage the mods table so that now when you get to this pairs, this will be the correct mods, as opposed to just the ones that were pre-node. So that's node. Um, we didn't even discuss how this propagate all works. But we can, if you're interested, but I don't know if you are, use propagate all. It takes a list, and then it goes through the list and propagates. And propagate checks if, if the scene number is correct, and that's what's incremented here. This isn't really incremented, as in 
or as much as it's just given a new identifier value. So this says change the scene value so that when you propagate, you can check if you've seen it before, if it equals scene. And then when you add one, it mar marks everything that was seen before it's not seen just because it's no longer equal. And then um, it inserts into active terminators or nodes depending on if it has this flag. This is, again, this is another data structure that exists and we haven't covered. I think that covers everything pretty much, unless you want to look at the specific calls up here. Um, one important thing is error checking that I want to go over. Hold on. Let's scroll down to like, like ease or something and then do the error checking. Because this is a bit weird. You might think of ease as something that takes in one function or one argument, which is just the table. But it also has this depth and name. And it's like, what is the depth and the name? So that might be a good question if you're interested in that. I don't know exactly what else to cover. That'll work. Yeah. But depth and name is the debug information. So the idea is if we look at the definition of add, you'll notice that it calls ease, right? But if I have a mistake in my add, I don't want it to tell me, oh, line 269 in your template.xml is wrong, because that's not useful. I want it to tell me where I called add, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is um, depth is the number of call frames ahead that you go. So in add, it will start with um, one. And then here, you're passing in one to depth. So ease will start with two. And then if you'll notice, this depth and name, and the name is also the, the entry point name. So here, it defaults to add. So that way, it will tell you hey, by the way, there's an error with add on this line. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of an error with ease, even though it was technically an error inside of ease. But that's how the name, what the name is doing. And then yeah. the depth is the call depth. And you'll notice we call this screen error function. And that's how we report errors. Um, and screen error um, does this illegal trick with pcall error. So <laughs> if you know what error does... Um, error can take in a string and then a like a depth, and this will tell you how far up the call stack the error to, to place blame on. So because we've kept track of the depth properly, it will tell you basically whoever immediately called. Here's where the blame is, and then um, error also takes in a string, which is your error message, and this is, this is the error message. And then um, we p call it, which is kind of illegal because p call is supposed to catch errors, right? I'm sure. I'm, I don't know if you've used p call before, but it's kind of illegal to p call error because you know this is going to cause a problem. But what we're doing here is we're getting this error value, which is like a stack trace information. So this is a way to, without the debug library, figure out the line number of who called you, and also add on an error message. And then we scream and system message that to make sure that the game doesn't crash, but the person who's coding knows that something went wrong. Yeah. So that's screen error. And then um, every single thing does this exact. This is the format for it. it is depth equals that, name equals name or, and then the name of the function. And then you call screen error with just depth and name. And anytime you call any other thing, you call depth and name. So that's how you add debug information. I feel like that P call error is like taking someone's lunch money so you can feed a homeless person. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's fucked up, but like, it's kind of necessary. Yeah, we don't have access to the debug library, and I don't think this would be a good use of the debug library anyway. Basically, this is the error we would want to throw, except for instead of throwing it, we're going to just system message it instead. Instead of crashing the game. And this is less important as they add like the crash pop-up windows where it's not actually crashing, it's just um popping up in a window. But yeah. this was this whole concept was implemented before we had those pop-ups, and this yeah. might be but worth it. But honestly, I like that better than the pop-up windows. Yeah. It might be worth tossing out, but there's not really a reason to go in and change everything. I don't think there's a reason. I honestly would prefer to keep that in. Or unless yeah. you add like a legacy. Like I have no reason thing. to take it out. It's too much effort to take it out. Yeah. 
Um, because it's literally just these two lines and then deleting this for everywhere. And it's like I've already done it and this is not too hard to copy paste around. So I might as well stay yeah. in style. Um, and if you'll notice, it's always returning ease, which is the chain call strategy. If you return a function, then you can chain the function. If you don't know what chain function is for all of you listeners, um, it's a thing that we technically support. Not that it really matters. Um, oh, and there's this whole previous mod system. I don't know if you remember there's a get function. Yeah, there is. I uh, realize, I remembered today that there's a get function. Yeah, and it's illegal. Um, literally, whenever you call ease, it immediately writes into it, to this previous mods. Wow, because I was. Um, it doesn't even. It doesn't even read the beat number that you pass in. It I was care. earlier just like, how am I gonna fix mini for the uh, SM5 conversions? I need to like read the mod that's on uh, that's on Zoom Z. And I was like, um, get is like, not how you'd want to do that. Ideally, you would do that with like a node because nodes can read during the frames. Get is like read. In well, yeah, relation. but like, oh, I would just, I don't remember how to like pass in mods into nodes. Um, you literally just the name of the mod. So like, if I if I make a node. Oh, so I need to pass in mini zoom z. Right? I'm I'm smart. You just you can put zoom z here. And then anytime Zoom Z is changed, it will specifically call this function. Or if you have like another thing, let's say I have like food. Food. And let's say this is a define mod. Or this this has been aux, but Zoom Z hasn't. Let's say, you know, just for convenience sake. Then now anytime either food changes or zoom z changes or both, it will call the function. And okay. the way the arguments work is that you get Z, Zoom Z, and then foo, and then PN if you want it. But I, I think the style should be don't use PN unless you need it. Okay. Right? So that's how Node works. And I, if you can tell, this is very illegal. Like, what's the function signature of the function you pass in? Well, it depends on <laughs> the number of strings before it. Yeah. Is not a, a convenient thing to deal with. And you'll notice um, if you watch or if you read through the Node code, it isn't a convenient thing to deal with. The reason I chose, I designed it that way had nothing to do with convenience on the back end. It had everything to do with convenience on the front end. I wanted it to be easy to write a note. Yeah. At pretty much all costs. So then um, set, this might, you might find this funny, but with set, it's literally just um, zero instant. It's, it's ease, but with the length of zero and the ease is instant. I don't know if you've heard that before, but it's kind of funny. Yeah. So that's how that works. And then add is the same with, with relative equals true. And then reset does a bit more work. It um says self.reset equals true. It um will fill in zero instant if you haven't given it anything. Um and it will shuffle this exclude table to have string keys for mods as strings as opposed to just numbers in there. Um, funk is illegal. Check that out. Oh. Oh. Yeah, well, a, B, C, D, E, F equals self 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> if type A is number and type B is number and type C is function and type D is number and type E is number and type F is function. Then we do this. We, we reassign A, B, C equals A, B and then this new C. Couldn't you that? like... Uh, is there a way to do like um, like how you can do multi uh, like you can assign um to multiple variables on a single um a single line by doing mm -hmm. like like local what yeah what you're doing up there that that uh, local a, assignment. ABC equals A B. But then. could you do like a could you do that for equalities? For checking equality, no. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, so, like, the way it's parsed, if I had an equality check in here, um, the commas have lower precedence. And I'm sure you could you could. Well, what I'm saying, what, I'm, what I mean this. is, like, where you have that is this if equals statement. equals isn't comparing these two items and these four, seven items. It's literally self to, that's, that's how equals work. So you, there's no way to do it with list. Uh, so there's no way to do, like, if type A, type B, type D, type E equals number, 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 or something like that? No, I could maybe make a helper function and put, like, a table here. That would be nice. Um, but I'm not doing that. Yeah. Do it. 
Um, it'd only be nice for you, and you already did it like this. So. I already did it, yeah. And then I, if I change this, it's, there's a chance that this persist logic will go crazy. Because if you remember, the persist inputs are anything can be persist, but um, specifically these function e de eases default to persist being on. The per mm -hmm. frame syntax defaults to persist being off. Um, but it can, all of that can be changed. And then um, messages where you just have a number and a function. If you notice, here's the spot where it swaps out A, and then the length is nil, and then B is the, the function. B is the function right here. So um, that's what that does there. And then I have the persist logic here. And then we write back into the table what, what we figured out here without the shorthand anymore. And then we create this mods table only if it's one of these forms that can use pop shits, right? So if you'll remember like this, technically I could take in a comma pop shits here, right? Yeah. But through the power of static analysis, also known as just looking at this line, I have determined that this doesn't use options. So down <laughs> here, um, I don't need to make that, where was it? Right here, I don't need to make this mods table and fill it out. Okay. Um, so that's fun. Very fun. And then it adds into this funks table, and then here's the defer. We have to do this priority. I wanted to go over the defer how this works. Yes, I just learned about this uh, a little while ago. Yeah, I, no one knows it exists except for me, me and maybe Chegg might remember, but not. And apparently oh, and I think the, that uh, I taught Kid about it, so. Yeah, here's some illegal code here. Um, If D, if you remember D is defined up here, D is a number. Is, if this is present, then um, it's one of these top variants. So we do a recursive call to Funk but with um, magic going on. It's magic. And this is this is persist magic. Yep. This is how these guys default to persist, and this one doesn't here. <laughs> it's it's cursed. But anyway, defer. We've got a priority, and if you'll notice, funks dot n is literally the length of this funks table, right? Mm -hmm. So by no, by default, this will count up from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, etc. And you can imagine how that priority would be useful for the behavior that I described earlier mm -hmm. with funks where they have to run in the order that you've added them, even if the start beat is in a different order. Right? Yep. That's what the priority is for. Um, and I also use this logic for, um, what is it, nodes? Nodes have a priority somewhere. A little bit node. Here's node, and um, here's the same priority logic. Okay. Right, if defer, then we do negative value. Otherwise, we do positive. And you might be thinking, hold on, doesn't a negative value mean it runs very first instead of the very end? Isn't that wrong? But we'll get there where it checks the priority. I'll actually jump there right now because we've kind of covered everything besides node and we'll go over node in a bit. Define mod, by the way, is just calling aux for all of the things at the beginning until it hits a non-string and then it calls node. So skip over compile nodes. Um, okay, so here's begin update command. Um, and you'll notice we sort over the functions here right? Mm -hmm. And we don't actually just compare the here, nodes is probably a better sort, but um, notice you don't actually just compare the priority. You compare x squared y to y squared x. And you might be thinking, hold on, isn't that stupid? And you would be right. <laughs> Um, the, the way you'd think about this is this is comparing x to y, but it's also multiplying both sides by x times y, right? Yeah. And so what that does is if one of them is negative and the other one is positive, then it flips the direction you compare, and so the, po the negative one will always be last because you flipped it, right? Yeah. So by default, negative one's always before because that's how negative would work, numbers work, but because you're multiplying both sides by x times y... It flips it, so the negative ones are later. Right? Yep. 
but then it also compares negative numbers correctly. So that's a weird trick that I use to make it so that negative numbers mean like, you know, very, very, very low priority, but also still in order. And so obviously for funks, we care more about the beat that it's activated on than the specific priority. But for nodes, there is no beat that it's activated on, so we just sort by priority here. And this is the stable sort from before. So that's the priority. I want to go over scan named actors now. I'm just kind of randomly going through all of this <laughs> stuff. You can tell there's not really an order at this point anymore. So scan named actors is the name equals syntax. Um, so I don't know if you know not if you normally, but technically you can put a name on an actor. Name equals foo, right? Mm -hmm. I guess you'd need um. Hold on. You want quotes here, but um. Anyway, this is kind of illegal. Well, so what this does normally is literally just when you have an actor, colon, you can do get name. And that's literally all it's for, right? Yeah. And then you can do um, parent, colon, child, or get child, and you can pass in the name, right? And this is not a useful way of using names. So I was like, why don't we do magic with the name equals, right? Because name equals seems nice. Um, like some nice syntax sugar, so we'll make it magical. And this is where the magic happens. This is like the most magical part of the magic, in my opinion. Um, you haven't gone to the nodes yet. Well, I mean, <laughs> other than the nodes. But... Yes, this is pretty magical. So um, we make this local function called sweep, and we sweep through all of the actors, and we we have a code, a string builder with code. And so we code... We add into the code. This is a call syntax. It's kind of cursed on line 631-ish. Um, but if you remember, calling a string builder appends. Yep. So this is appending actors dot, and then the name that you type in equals, and then just reading a list. And the reason why we can just have this and know that this is going to be the actor is because we've literally put the actor at that spot in the list on the line before. And the plan is when we load string this code down here, we're going to pass in that same list so that when this code runs, the, the word list in here in the string is referring to the same list out here. So it will be able to pull the actor from the right index and put it into the actors table here. But if you'll remember the actors table, you don't actually read the actors table. You don't type actors dot in front of everything. So we have this, um, we clear the meta tables with this recursive function, and then we go through the actors table and move it into the zero table. And then that's how that works pretty much at a high level. And I don't really want to go over this, the code building, but we can if you need more details. I don't think you will though. You understand what's going on there, right? Yep. Hopefully, no questions. Sue, are you there? Yes, I am here. <laughs> okay, perfect. No questions. Oh, though? I already know how the the get name thing works. You had me uh, you had me exploit it. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fun fact. Is you technically this name is controlled by the person who's filling in the name. So anything that's syntactically accurate here technically compiles. Um, so you can have fun with that if you're interested. But um, we're not interested right now. That's a that's an exercise for the listener. Um, and we scan named actors in an on command. So use the on command, use the call to that. Simplifies the on command a lot. And then we can Q command begin update, which is this. So step one is you hide all the things. And then we load up the P table. And then we um, call that load command on the foreground. And you might be thinking, hold on, isn't the load command not on the foreground, but on um, specifically in your mod that isn't it like mods.xml. And fun fact, um, open ITG is broken and plain command is always um, recursive. It calls all of its children if you call it on an active frame. So all commands always literally um, call on all of their children as well. Fun fact. Isn't that pretty cursed? Yeah, that's not. If you play any <laughs> command on an actor frame ever, it always, by default, will also play it on all of its children in OpenIDQ. So that's how this load actually loads your mods at XML and all of the plugins at the same time. 
<laughs> yep. And, and then after we've run your load code, you can sort the tables and prepare. And then we resolve aliases. So after you've created these tables, it goes in and, sh and fixes all the aliases. And then after that, you compile all the nodes, which this is the most illegal function out of everything. Yeah, um, I oh. noticed that coding um, or moving code to SM5, like, I, 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 I found out that um, compile nodes exists. And I was like, yeah, and we can go over that I if you're interested. I don't think I would want to look in that at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, and it works as is. Yeah, it should, it it's already. Be... I I imagine it's already a lot to digest right now. This is probably. Yeah. Already... So anyway, I have some default mods, and you might be thinking, why would you have nodes by default? Don't people not want to opt in? But fun fact, um, things are terrible. <laughs> oh yeah, you forgot Zoom Z there. No, it's intentionally not Zoom Z. Why? So in not ITG, whenever you use the Zoom function, it will only apply Zoom X and Zoom Y, right? Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, but a lot of people um, use ZoomZ, uh, the tween mod. Oh, I know, I know. So you just... <laughs> okay. Oh, I should set the Z default... ZoomZ should be set default to one. Yeah. This is a bug fix. Um, the node doesn't need anything, but this set default... That is yeah, another the node doesn't bug... need anything. That is another bug report. Thank you for... This is this is what I'm getting that out of That one actually comes from Kino. And it was in a, uh, it was in the um, Kino Lua in disgrace. <laughs> terribly sorry about that. Thank you for the bug report. And I also Thanks, do move back. So again, in not ICG, Zoom is an alias for Zoom X and Zoom Y. You know what I mean? So if I call um, apply game command and I call you know two hundred Zoom. But then I do it again later, and then I call it for 100 Zoom Z, or Zoom X, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. If you think through this, you might think what would happen is, oh, we, we double the Zoom, 2X Zoom, and then Zoom X was already 100, so it will do nothing, right? Yeah, that's how it that's not how it works. The way not ITG usually works is this Zoom X, so this Zoom literally subs in for 200 Zoom X, 200 Zoom Y, right? It does this like blind string replacement style. And now you can see this line does indeed accomplish the 2x zoom, but this will squish it on the x axis back down, right? Isn't that kind of illegal? I, I like so, it that way, to be honest. But yes, it is legal. Oh, I did not mean to paste that. I meant to undo this. Oh, I did it again. It. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's kind. Of, it's kind of weird that you can zoom x and then it like changes the value of zoom, and the template is not meant to think that way. So instead, I make an aux for zoom that will hold the value of zoom, and then I combine it the way you would expect, where um, it takes the value of zoom x and zoom y that you've get, that they've given it, and um, it will take the zoom value and multiply them in, and then just apply it with zoom x and zoom y because zoom is aux now, right? Yep. So that's how that patches that, and then. We've got this fix. Thank you for the fix. And then the same thing with MoveX. So if I call MoveX, we can do another example. I call a apply game command 100 MoveX. Pretend I'm not crazy. And then I have apply game command, and then I have 0 MoveX 0. Right? Mm -hmm. You might think... Oh, this is the column specific version, so it's going to be separate, and everything's just going to be moved 100 move X, and then this line's going to do nothing, right? That might be intuitive, but that's not what not IGG does. Not IGG, this literally subs in for move X 0, move X 1, move X 2, move X 3, move X 4, move X 5, all the way up to 7, actually. So in SM5, it goes up to 15, but in not IG, internally it's... Well, actually, it goes from 1 to 16, but... Um, 1 to 16. Yeah, fair you enough. You won't have to worry about that soon. <laughs> um, This is a not ITG template, so it's not too important, and yeah. yes, you won't have to worry about that soon. So anyway, now with this new expansion, you'd see this actually has the unintuitive behavior of this line moving the column back, right? 
And obviously that doesn't work with the mirror templates shenanigans. So it's the same solution here is we make an aux for movex. And then we, so it can have its own value that's independent of the columns with movex, as opposed to literally just writing into the columns with movex. And then xmod and cmod, um, they can't, so the reason that these are using a node is because they can't use the special string builder that we have all the way down here. They can't use this guy right here, right? See this line in the update command forever ago, we were applying in mod buffer. We were adding times negative one, a percentage of a mod. Yeah. But um, this doesn't work for xmod and cmod. So instead, I go and aux these and then in the node, I make it just directly called mod buffer. And if you'll if you'll notice, this seems kind of illegal. Why are you calling mod buffer? Well, is mod buffer local or not? Um, I think mod buffer is uh, is global. global. Yeah. But anyway, if you remembered the exact time that we happened to run the node functions, you'll know that mod buffer happens to be set to the player that's currently relevant, and building the string in the right spot, right? So for nodes, this is kind of magically the mod or the buffer of the current player that I am about to build right now. You know, it's kind of set up like that perfectly. Yeah. So, and then it's just a string dot format because um, you can't actually. So in non IPG or in Lua, it likes to print these numbers as like one e minus nine if it's too small, right? Yep. Yeah. And this format does not work in a speed mod. This is not valid, right? Oh, yeah. So that's why I'm using string dot format here and I'm using dot dot to concat literally everywhere else. And you'll also notice there's some illegal I'm applying both the xmod and the cmod. And that is because xmods and cmods when they're on at the same time like mix with each other. So that's why these have to be in the same node is so that I can ensure that it will always appear as x first and then c second in the mod string whenever it gets applied. And then there's a special case for cmod being zero, and you can't do that in my template. Too bad. Um, <laughs> if you really need a zero cmod effect, um, make your own template. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then we have the default xmod is one. Cmod. What you want? Zero xmod next. Um, I've used zero xmod in this template before. I have too. I mean, I got <laughs> yelled at you before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there used to be an apply modifiers out here that did times zero zero x. Fun fact, historically. And what this says is basically turn off the activation rate for your x mod so that once after you do the clear all, don't actually clear the x mod. Just have it be approaching forever. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which is a like a the really jank way to say. You know, clear all, but not this one. Yeah. This one just stay approaching. <laughs> That's extremely, like, that it's feels extremely, extremely illegal. Little, yeah. And it's not here anymore. You're stuck to 1x, which hopefully is nasty enough that people will get bothered and switch it to some other X, X mod value. Yeah. Which will probably help in people setting an actual default and being like, oh, I can yeah, it, make it more readable just by changing how fast the arrow scroll. So now we've covered pretty much everything. Um, one good thing to keep in mind is I don't actually... Um, it doesn't actually work if you have a player missing. So one thing in SM5 is that a lot of people play with one player and then are like, why does it not work? Because they're not in not ICG where it forces you to two-player mode like a good like a good player. Like a good bean. Like a nice, a nice person using the code and not an evil person being like, I don't know how to use mods. <laughs> So um, I designed this assuming that they're both the players will be present and it will just crash if you don't. Like crash the game that, it, or crash the template? Crash the template. Okay. It might crash the game. I don't. I oh, think I it will it pop up the. I think it'll pop up the box and get mad at you. Yeah, I think that's all it does actually. Because um... um. Yeah, and so I need to clear to solve that. I think technically. The only, oh, I did not need to do You that. could do a uh, late join for I know you can for not IDG. Which I think it just uh, adds in um a player without spending a token or whatever. Basically it just puts the second player in there. 
Well, and I do check it for the player's existence every frame here. So we're up to the task. The only thing is, I think specifically the mods at XML that I have provided by default just applies the proxies, assuming that the players will exist. Oh, so yeah, if you want true. to make it, if you want to make it um, player indifferent, you need to either delete that proxy code that comes in by default or change it. And I am definitely open to changing the default. It's just a matter of I want that default to be as simple as humanly possible. Because um, that's the only code that's forced onto the user. Mm -hmm. And the reason it needs to be there is because if you want to change your proxies up, you know, if I want to make a proxy wall, I don't want to be forced to delete the existing proxies and then, you know, use my own. I, I don't want to learn that kind of on the spot. So you want to have the bare minimum code there. Could we use like a. Can. Um, can we like what? get the amount of players? Like. You can check if a player exists. It's literally this. If PPN. We'll check if a given player exists. Well, because what I'm wondering is if... Because um, there's an internal variable, you know, um, for the um, zero uh, meta table. Like, you can use it using uh, get raw. It's like zero dot PLR, I think. Something yes. Like that. So there's there's um specific magic with when you call ease like ease, you know pretend this is right, and we have um plr equals yeah right. Um this isn't this has nothing to do with um like it doesn't have to do with how many actual players are in there. It just has to do no, with this like this so default one and two. In your game code, you're allowed to just literally write to this as a global, and then anytime you call ease, it will read this global. And the reason that's a raw get is so that it doesn't read the global variable PLR. So if someone comes in and underscore G PLR equals two, let's say you have a theme that uses PLR as a variable name, it okay. doesn't want to mess it up. So that's why the raw raw get is done. But it's not really that magic. Okay. Um, get rid of that. Um, what else are we gonna go over? We can go over the nodes if you want, or we can go over the next files. So main.xml creates the zero table and then loads all the other fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Standard.xml loads first and it's just some functions. Templates.xml we recovered. Mm -hmm. Ease.xml just has a bunch of ease definitions. Plugins.xml is the important one. And then mods.xml is user's code. So we've covered main. Plugins.xml is also the most offending looking one in my opinion. Oh, it is, yeah. Um, my syntax highlighter doesn't even highlight it. That's how we'll there it is. Oh. Yep. Um, I can go over this if you want, but it's a recursive algorithm. Well, because what I'm thinking is that we so. probably don't even need to make these um, uh, in XML. Use, we could just make this in Lua and load the Lua. Yeah, and then use Arctic's general recursive XML. Well, because we don't need to actually, like, make these into layers since it's just code that we're oh, running they do need to be made into layers oh why um i have made at least one plugin that is also an actor that is not hidden okay um and i'm not sure if that's supposed to be officially supported but if you will notice this thing doesn't hide itself so it's technically visible and you Wait, made so that plugin is it? hide it it's a, my aft frame rate limiter plugin, I think. Oh, okay. But technically, plugins are allowed to draw to the screen, although it's kind of not good practice to do so because it's mm -hmm. always going to draw into the user's code. Yeah. Um, and maybe that should change. I don't know because that particular file has already been made and there's no extra work happening on it, and I don't think people are using that yeah. plugin because it was just for the one file. We'll see where that goes, but this could very easily be just running code and no actors. Yeah. Um. I feel like especially. I feel like plugin. Sorry. I feel like separating plugins and scripts would be kind of a good thing because like scripts can run just straight from Lua since they wouldn't have any like thing to render, but plugins could possibly have something that isn't hidden. Yeah. Although I'm fine 
Um, no one else has made a plugin that is visible, so I'm fine changing the, the scope of a plugin to say, you know, in the new version, plugins are weaker in that they can't draw anything anymore. And I'd be fine with that. Okay. I haven't, um, yeah, I haven't yet to see anybody actually draw things. Yeah. With them. So that's everything except for Node, and here's the fun part we've procrastinated for last. Unless somebody makes, for... like, an easy Shader Writer plugin. But I don't um, no. see that being possible, or... If you make, if you succeed in your SM5 thing, you can always have a um, plugin that exposes a def.actor thing. Yeah. Like, imagine I have this thing, you know, like... Function... Oh, function create easy shader. Right? And then this just returns def. You know what I mean? You could you could very easily incorporate your functions into the the loading process if you want. Yeah. Right? Because if you notice, if you remember, it loads the plugins before the user code. All yeah. of the order stuff is like incredibly precisely ordered, which is um why stuff like this ends up working. But so if you if you made a function like this, you could still have it involved in the actor creation process while also being a plugin slash script. So I don't think we need to distinguish that much. Anyway, yeah. compile nodes. Um, we make a table called terminators, which holds the terminator nodes. So terminator nodes are a special type of node that you don't create as the user, but it creates internally to keep track of things. Um, and I forget why I called them that, fun fact. <laughs> so for every single node, um, you might notice that this is a format that's different, right? So we should start with the node code. Um, here's node. So we do our debug information. We say curly braces if it needs to be a table. We have the inputs. We've got whatever reverse in is. I'm not even sure yet. So step one is we load up the inputs, right? So we loop through until we hit a function. While, while we have strings, we load this into this inputs table. And then also, this is an illegal line of code. Um, this should be a set default. I'm going to change this. In, I'm going to add that to my bug reports. Um, that node has an add on Okay, so anyway, um, this add function does nothing. It literally just massages the meta tables, if you will, to say, hey, you've got a node reading from this value, so it better have a value. Right? So you can't have the mod that's never been applied and then read from it, because that would be bad. Um, and then it checks for a node, it checks for the function, and then it loads up out. And then, does it even use this reverse in? Hold on. Oh, it uses it. Down there. Hold on. Oh, nope, this is out of scope. Look at that. 418 unused variable reverse in. That was worth looking into. So anyway, that doesn't matter. So we have here's in inputs is the list of all the strings that go in in order. We have out, which is the list of all the, the strings that are after the function in order. And then we have the function itself. And this is the format that we store nodes in initially is just a list of in, the list of out, and the function, right? Okay. And then we do the same priority dance, right? And this isn't bad because we haven't compiled the nodes yet. Here's compile nodes, which gets called after all of the nodes are inserted. So compile nodes, we make this terminators thing. We go through nodes. ND is like the current node. And um, everything in the outputs has a terminator. So anytime your node writes out to a mod, it needs to have a term that mod needs to have a terminator. 
and each mod has the potential to have a terminator if the nodes touch it and then um every single terminator will have this right here this should be as incredibly illegal as it looks um, we've got a table with K and a table, and then an empty table, and then five nils, and then a true. And you might be thinking, like, wait, why isn't? Why did you do that? Isn't that kind of crazy? And yes, we got. Here's here's my map right here. Here's this dropped. Um, that is what we're looking for, or not what we're looking for. This is the format of a node. We've got. We've got a list of the inputs. We've got a list of the outputs and then the function, like before, like this format up here. Where was it? I kind of passed it. It's like this format right here. In out function, in table, out table function, except for we've got a lot of other ones. We've got a list of children, which are um, nodes that read from mods that we are writing to that have been defined after this current node has been defined. So nodes are dependent on the order you define them for, um, and that's how it keeps track of that. And that's empty as of now, and we are going to fill that out in a moment. Terminators don't have these things. We've got a list of parents. We've got, and the reason this is a double list is because um, this is a list of all of the mods that we take in. And then this is the list of all of the nodes that, that write to that mod. And then we've got the, no, the struct, and then that's the parents. We've got the real function, not this function. This is the real function. <laughs> um, and we'll get to that later. Oh, okay. We've got a list of outputs. So the outputs don't actually write straight into the mods table. They write into this string, this table here. So we have a table, and then we've got this is this list is player specific, and then this is the map of string to, to mod value. So this right here maps like here are the outputs that that I want to write out to the world, and the reason that has its own table is that so that it can remember even if I haven't run the 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 ease or even if I haven't run the node this frame, this is what it most recently output based on you know assuming that any everything its input hasn't changed. So then we've got this bool terminator, which is whether or not it's a terminator node. And the terminator nodes are these guys up here, which we'll explain later. But those are the special nodes that we add in. And then we've got int scene, which we don't actually write to here at all. Scene is just a flag for searching it forever down here, if you remember how scene worked. Um, the idea is you need to search and mark things that have been seen before, but then you need to quickly clear. Um, oh, I haven't seen anything yet, so I can do another propagation scan through the whole thing. And the way I do that is I, buy, I take the, the official seed number and add one to it, and so this might be an outdated value, maybe. So it can check. But that's used at runtime and not set up now. So now... Hold on off the highlight um we grab this terminator value from the nodes so this node includes it includes these terminators that are set up but it also includes a bunch of these from this node function it includes these in out functions so ones that have just these first three put in and we need to we need to solve all of the other four so if it's a not if it's not a terminator we've got a initialize these children and these outputs so that's what that does and then here no data five is the table as well these parents and this is done for all things including terminators and then we unpack the table um, into these variables here you can see how this is like unpacking right yeah if i modify this i'm still modifying the table so I just I wanted clean names for everything because these numbers are miserable to work with. I really want to go in and change this format so that all of the, the keys are strings in the node, although that will technically be add for performance. So anyway, we go through all of our inputs, and we have a reverse in, which is like a lookup table. You can give it a mod name, and it will just be true if the mod 
is used and false if the mod isn't used, right? So you don't have to iterate. Um, for convenience, and then we have this start table where we're start. Start is a global here, not really global, but it's um, it's not per node, it's per one compiled session. And um, I'm kind of interpreting this as I go. So um, we make sure that the, the specific input has a start table and we toss ourselves into the start table. Okay. Um, so the concept there is let's say I have a node that reads from like invert, then anytime invert is active way down here in our, um, in our update command, right here, we check the start and say, hey, you know, which nodes do I need to activate knowing that invert is on? And most of the time that would be nothing, but if there's a node that reads from your particular mod, that's where the start comes in. And you'll notice that was called node start. We'll, we'll find where the variable gets renamed at some point, but it doesn't really matter. It's the same table. Um, so here we are back at the node code. Here's the loop for nodes. Here's the terminator logic we put over. Um, and then we make sure start has a table and we insert ourselves into it if it's not locked. And I already completely forgot what locked is. So we'll get to that when that happens. <laughs> um, oh, it's locked if something writes to it. So for example, if there's another if there's another node that writes to invert, for example, then we don't need to activate that node if invert is changed. We need to activate that node if its parent has changed. So now it has a parent that's separate. So that's what's going on with lock. Okay. I think. Um, so if it's not locked, then we go to the start. Otherwise, we go and find who our parent should be based off of the I, which is the um, um, it's comp a parent is this guy. So we want to, we, we just set, um, hold on. Why do we set that to true? What is zero here? Who knows? What are you here? What well, is the number zero? And my understanding is that we didn't have. So parents is a list of list of nodes. The inner wait, there's a comment there. What? The inner lists also have a zero field that is a boolean. Yeah, it's a boolean. We set it to true. Okay. And do we ever read it? We do read it way down here. So if it's not true. Oh, so zero is true. If oh, so if it's also... locked, then it sets that to true, and then it won't uh -huh. execute whatever that code is, which is, I guess, setting um, a mod or something like that. Down here specifically, it's um. Hold on. So it looks like it's just pretty much locking. So this is building on. strings here. Yeah. So um, you say parents. I J. Um. I don't know what J is. Oh, J is this. So parents this P N. This. And then we potentially add. This guy. If it's unlocked. Okay, I see. Um, this is a complicated concept, and it's. Locked is not a good name for it, <laughs> and I'm too lazy to explain it. But basically, um, if you write to a mod, if you're not the first one to read from it, then um, then you don't want to be reading from it. You want to be doing something else. It's kind of weird, but um, basically, this is setting up. This is setting up like a because we're looping through these nodes in order, specifically in the order that they were added, um, considering the priority, because it's been sorted in between the end of this and the start of compile nodes, um, this builds like a giant tree sort of thing. And if you'll notice that these have um, the nodes inside of them for parents and children, 
and as the start and last, which are the important ones. Um, which tell you if if I am a, a mod, which nodes immediately read from me. And then the nodes internally will tell you whether or not they indirectly read from you because um, they have an internal tree structure or, no, or what is it called? They have an internal graph structure. That's why they're called nodes. And then we've got last, which is important for terminators. Um, so we go through here and on each function, we compile some code. And you might be thinking, what does this code do? And that's a good question. So these are local functions, so they don't get called. So when the code, the control flow comes in, we're done with this tree building, this note, this um, graph building phase. So we define a bunch of local functions and we make this code string builder. Um, and then we create this function right here. So we return a function that takes in some inputs. And the reason we do that is just so that we can pass these in. So um, you can't really put objects into this code because we're building a string. So the idea is if I pass this outputs as in here, then I can have the word outputs like this, and it refers to the real outputs object because we are calling this and we are kind of calling this function. So this isn't a function like because it's useful as a function. This is just a function to introduce these variable names into the scope so that we can pass them in and get this function here, which is the ND6, which is the real function. If you remember down here, we have real function. This in here is that real function. And the way we do that is if it's a terminator, then we want to actually write into the mods table. So this is the mods table, if you remember before. In the update loop, we write straight into mods PN, and we write this mod right here, which is inputs one, because all terminators only take in one input. And they take that input mod and they take this emit inputs function and write it in. And this imp emit inputs function will read from the parents. So if a node writes to there, then it will read from the parents. Um, so this is how, if you remember the nodes up here, they, when they're outputs, they're actually write it to this map thing, which is um, not actually getting applied. So the terminator's job is to um, accept the output like this, read it from the parents or from the mod directly, depending, and then actually write it back into this mods table. And then otherwise, if we're a normal thing, then we emit these outputs. So this is the outputs table here which is this outputs table here, which is um, no data seven. So it's this table on the, here. So it actually writes it to its own internal fields normally. And then so we'll do that. And if it has outputs, then it will um, put an equal sign. Otherwise, um, so this if statement is kind of weird, but if state emit outputs will return whether or not it wrote anything out. So, um, this basically says if you have any outputs, then say those outputs equals, otherwise do nothing. And then we call this FN, which you might be thinking, what is FN? And that comes from here, which comes from here, which comes from here is the function that they provide. So the idea here is that I want to call the function that the user provided with the correct arguments in the correct order. And that is where this in in inputs thing comes from, is we read the inputs either directly from the parents. Um, and remember, if we have more than one parent, this is a for loop and it will add all the parents together. And otherwise, it will, well, it's not otherwise. This is um, in a very certain condition, it will also add the mods PN on there. Um, and so that's how that works. It will emit the inputs, it will read from the parents, and that goes into the function, the fn right here. So that's how it actually reads the arguments and applies them in the right order, is it's literally building a string and then load stringing it. So that way, actually at runtime, when you're during the update loop, it can just call a function that is literally pre-written to do the exact thing it needs to do without any 
magic generic code in it anymore because all the magic generic code happens here. And then we add comma pn because, um, of course, we want it player specific if the person who wrote the node chooses to use it. And that comes from this pn right here, which will come from when they call the real function. So you just have to call the real function with the player number. And if you call them in the right order, then this will read with this in the inputs. It will read from the parent's output. And that's how it, um, that's how the nodes propagate through. And then obviously the terminator would write it back to mods. So that's basically the game plan there. And this code is nasty and that's because we're using this code string builder. So if you remember code is a string builder. So anytime you call it, including with this chain syntax, it will just toss it into this variable. And then we run dot colon build which this isn't anything to do with like building real code. This is literally the table at concat. And then we load string it. And then I have an assert here. So if there's something that goes wrong in this string creation process, which um shouldn't happen unless people put in like non-mod names into node, which even then shouldn't be a problem because I'm always calling this escape, escape string function, which puts some um, like, quotes around everything and escapes it. So basically this assert is just an internal assert for me to make sure that it's compiled correctly. Um, and that should go correct if all of this code is correct, but who knows. Um, and then we take that compiled code and we pass in all of the variables it needs as context. And um, that goes into the real function. And then if it's not a terminator, we actually call the node. So you might be thinking like, you know, hold on, if I don't touch the functions, shouldn't it, um, I'm just realized during the middle of my explanation, this line might not be necessary. Um, 418 might not be necessary, or 421 might not be necessary. 421 might be necessary. I'm just going to write that down on my notes. I'll investigate that later. But anyway, back to where we were. Sorry about that. Um, if it's not one of these terminator fake nodes that we've added in later, if it's one that a user has written, we call the function to basically make sure that there's no type error in your code. So that way, if you run it, have a node, it will run it guaranteed. So for example, a node that moves the background, this guarantees that it starts in the right spot, even if you are like playing the file and you're starting halfway through. It will run it at least once. And also, this runs the nodes in order, which is good because if you remember the nodes, kind of the, it's order dependent. So this will make sure that all of the parents have sensible pre-filled outputs here so that once a node starts reading from its parent, it will, um, it will propagate through properly. So that's what that does. And then we go in and unlock everything, apparently. Um, I think there was a flag V locked in here. Um, locked was a table here, but I'm not actually putting anything into it. The reason this is open curly brace, closed curly brace is just because I wanted a key to use like this that you could put inside of start um, without colliding with anything. So if you notice, I always, I never read locked directly. I do start be locked. And this is technically a table, but we don't really care what it is. It's just a unique value. So that's what's going on there. Kind of, that's not really a good definition, but basically we clear that out. And then we take the start, which was a local variable and write it to node start, which is a global variable that can be read later on. And it is read in the update command back down at the very bottom. We read node start here to determine from a given mod, if a mod is needs to be applied, which nodes to be need to be updated in regards to that. Hopefully that covers nodes. I don't know if you still have questions, pseudo, because I know you didn't know node before, so you might have any good questions. I don't know. Um, it but if not, basically just gives me a... That's a basic description of what's going on here.
Um, I know I didn't get into all the details. Well, I have a much of, deeper like, understanding of Node now. <laughs> than before, yeah. Yeah. And so you, yeah, one question that I, I don't know who asked me this, but I heard before is like, why are you doing load string? Isn't load string inefficient? But the whole point is that I don't want all of this because obviously there's a bunch of magic going on here. And yeah. the idea is ideally that would happen at compile time instead of runtime, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you are trying to like build up a table here and then table dot, um, what is it? Table dot unpack it into this function. Then you are building a table every frame and you are manipulating the table every frame and it's not great. So yeah. ideally we would literally emit the code that would read from the right spots and just pass it in like a like a good programmer yeah so like a good scene <laughs> yeah and if you were ever wondering where um hold on i was about to say if you were wondering where um this set function is used I was going to say this is where, but I'm not actually sure. Let's see if we can find the set function. Set. Oop, that's not how you spell it. Set. Um, that is not calling a function. So this might actually be unused legacy code. Hmm. What does this do? If self1, then self set. And if we go back, if i is not equal one, then code set. So I think this list function might be taking care of it. Okay. Um, so let me mark that down, that um, colon set in string builder might not be necessary. Um, but basically what this code does here is it will insert commas in between everything. So obviously on the first run, you don't want a comma, but then after every single other one, or before every single other one, you do want a comma, right? Mm -hmm. That's just how lists of things work. If you're trying to put something in this function slot, where you have a function and then you have something here, the first one doesn't need a comma in front of it, but everything else does. And so that's what this list function is. This is literally this right here. It says, if I is not one, then add the comma because code of something is literally adding it to the table because this is a string builder so this is you know basically saying insert the comma if you're not on the first one and i was typing that so many times insert this if you're not the first one that i decided to um to make that a helper function yeah um i think that covers everything now unless we want to talk about something else um uh, I think that's good on um yeah there's there's on. alias magic the way alias works is it loops through um this isn't the alias function here there's this normalize function which will just lowercase it and read the aliases and then there's resolve aliases which I want to get over quickly because it's kind of late and I want to go to bed but um resolve aliases goes through all the eases it calls that normalize mod function. It goes through all of the oxes, calls that normalize mod function, goes through all the nodes before they've been compiled, calls that normalize. Um, it will go through all of the default mods. If you look at this, this is kind of cursed control flow, but it will go and normalize all of it. Um, so. And that normalizes just the two lowercase and then follow through on that aliases table. So that's how you make it the aliases actually do something instead of just collecting them. Okay. And that, I believe, is everything. Thank you for listening. Okay. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But hopefully, I'm good at explaining. I'd like to believe. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, yeah. I think as a so final... How do you know what all the pieces are doing yeah. and how it works together to accomplish... Specifically, the mirror and templates goals. I didn't really go over alternative ways to do things. Like, you know, here's why they do it in Explosions template, and here's why I made it explicitly different. Because there are a lot of design decisions which I just mentioned, and I didn't explain why. But that does cover a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So I think as a parting question, um, mm -hmm. how, how long did it take you to completely make this template 
to the point of like production? Um, well, so it's gone through a lot of iterations. So there are a couple of ideas here that are brand new to the Mirren template. Like for example, this reset thing came in recently, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of stuff that happened forever and it's really an evolving process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like you can go back to early Xmon things and you'll so find some stuff that doesn't match at all and some stuff that seems like it was almost pulled out from the future. I just saw the Mirren template and copied that bit of it. Yeah. And it's because I invented it slowly over time. So like it's from, kind of been from like mm -hmm. the first like when you first decided I'm gonna make the Mirren template to when you actually said I made the Mirren template, like how long did that process take? I don't remember, but I will tell you when I decided I am going to make the Mirren template, I also had a Zero's Galaxy mod loader template, and I also had a Zero's mod loader template, and I also had two previous templates, and it's like, it's in a long series of of, of things. Yeah. I don't remember. I can try and find you the earliest version of the Mirren template that existed, and I can give you the date on that. I guess in a sense, I'm really just asking, like, to get to this point, like, how many, how many, like weeks months years of templates have you been writing i suppose um hold on um ba -ba 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 -ba. i'm scrolling through some dms here you go 9 p.m on what day is this um what is that October of 2019 is when the Mirren Template Friendship Time Discord DM group appeared. <laughs> and so. that was a long time ago. There are some design decisions that you would find a thousand percent illegal. <laughs> so it's and that been... involves not using Lua even here. Have a fun. I'll DM you at this sneak peek. This so it's sort been of about, I have to say, 16 <laughs> months that... Um, the Mirren template, as it has been officially named, yeah. has been started. Yeah, and there was obviously all sorts of development work before it was called the Mirren template, because I've gone through a bunch of template versions. Um, from the very beginning, my first mod file it was not anything elegant. It was probably worse, but mm -hmm. I did not use the templates they provided. Um, the way I learned to mod was actually by taking apart the mods bootcamp files and then putting together my own thing there. And then, um, because when I learned when I learned it that way, I was comfortable-ish with coding. There was never an idea of this is the part you don't touch, this is the part you do touch. So it's always evolved from there. Where, firstly, I tried to as much as I could understand what was going on, and then once you have a full understanding of how what you're using works, it makes it a lot easier to modify it. So, like for example, you might go on and make some tweak to the Mirren template. Now that you understand how all of the bits and pieces work. Oh yeah, I definitely do but, plan to do that. <laughs> yeah, and it's a lot easier to do that when you start with something as simple as the mods bootcamp template. So this is okay. a shout out to the mods bootcamp template for being simple to understand. Yeah. That yeah. is probably the one thing that the mirror template is bad at is that it takes a full explanation and you need to understand a ton of stuff about code. Yeah, editing the template itself to definitely do. takes a very strong understanding of not just the template but Lua as well. Yeah, and there's a bunch of hidden assumptions and stuff. You know, like that priority thing with the weird multiplication that kind of needs to be explained. And if you look yeah. at the, the other templates, usually they will be much better at being self-explanatory. And um, that's really where I learned how to make templates. So if yeah. someone else wants to follow in my footsteps, that's one way to do it, I guess. So I have a list of bugs that I need to fix now, or at least <laughs> type up into GitHub. Do that tomorrow. Um, Go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have no more questions, I can leave. But um, that's pretty much what's going on in the template. All right. Cool. Um, if you'll notice, most of that was Lua, right? There yeah. was not much, here's this actor, and here's this actor, and here's this command, and this, here's this command, because it was all in one giant block. And that should make it easy to toss into SM5, which I know you are planning to do. Yeah. To try and make this either work immediately in SM5. Yeah, I'm also like planning to kind of do a bit of like an XML recursion hack to kind of just be like um, setting up like actors and then just like... So basically the idea is I want to um, chuck a single like code 
um, XML into the children of the main actor frame. Mm -hmm. And then it'll just pull that and then it'll read like, okay, so what did we put in here? And um, what do we need to put in based on that? So kind of like what the plugins does. It just basically like, here's all of the... Uh, yeah, except for instead of just instead of building files, a sequence it's... of XML files once, you could take in an arbitrary def.actor, def.actor frame shape and yeah. build that up. And then it could use add command to add the commands in and add name. Or you can do a, there's a set name function to set the name. Yeah. There's a set shader function. The only thing is, is that I feel stuff. like I would have to just like straight up just shove in a bunch of layers there and just say like, however we have. And the condition is if we have stuff to put in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how Arctic Spin works too. Is ever, if you have an actor frame with like more than I think I think he used the number ten as well as I did. My plugins also used the arbitrary number yeah, ten. Yeah, but the thing is with that, it's kind of tricky because like you use mm -hmm. twice as many afts in Ghost Town alone. So there's going to have to be a lot of um, actors. Well, the way. In. You're gonna try and do the actor frame texture stuff as well. I I kind of the, the way Arctic's thing works is anytime you have an actor frame with more than ten items in it, it will create sub actor frames just so that it's technically less than ten items. But then those actor frames, you know what I mean? So I could have ten okay. actor frames with ten items each, and those are kind of virtual actor frames that don't really exist, quote unquote. Huh. And so that that way you can in your def that actors make any shape possible, and then in your recursive XML you only need ten lines of evil magic code, and it would huh. um, it would spit out any shape you want. That I'm is kind fair. of scared of your actor frame texture idea. Yeah, would but have I just really wanted to be a thing. <laughs> yeah, it would be really cool if you could. Yeah, so I'm gonna stop so, this video and send it to you. Yeah, that Eventually. would be great.